So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ruan Vasandani. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm an intern here working with Dr. Shah in the neurosurgery clinic, as well as working on various research projects, two of which I will be presenting today. So a case report. So what is a case report? A uh, case report is an important study of design uh, in advancing medical scientific knowledge um, due to the rarity of a disorder, a disease, or condition. So the first case report is a congenitally missing cervical pedicle, and it is of great importance because there's only been about 70 reported cases in the literature from 1946 uh, until present. Um, there's been cases of unnecessary surgical intervention, and therefore case reports are meant to create awareness in the diagnosis and treatment for a congenitally missing cervical pedicle. So we present this 17-year-old um, white obese female patient, uh, female who comes into the ER presenting after a motor vehicle accident. Her only complaint was upper back pain. Um, on initial assessment, uh, she was alert and oriented times three. She had a GCS of 15 and vital signs were within normal range. Um, on neuro and physical exam, she had a five out of five upper and lower extremity strength test. Um, she had two plus symmetrical upper and lower deep tendon reflexes. Um, she denied any loss of sensation, neither was it found on a physical and neuro exam. <clears throat> so the most important test to do initially, uh, and the diagnostic test of choice, is an MRI. And you do an MRI to make sure there isn't any cord compression, which can cause irreversible damage, uh, leading to a quadriplegic or a paraplegic state. So after an, uh, an MRI was done, it was interpreted as a C5, C6 subluxation, which is a slippage of the vertebrae. However, the doctor wasn't fully convinced of this diagnosis and then ordered a three-view x-ray, um, anterior-posterior flexion extension x-ray, which proved that she had uh, a jumped and locked facet joint at C5, C6, which I'll explain in more detail later on. But once again, not fully convinced, he ordered a CT scan, which eventually proved that the patient, in fact, did have a congenital absence of the left pedicle of the C6 vertebra. So as you can see here, uh, the pedicles, which uh, extend laterally from the tuba body, um, connect to the transverse process. Uh, they're found posteriorly, and uh, they provide stability to the entire vertebral segment, uh, thereby protecting the spinal cord. You guys all see the pedicles? No? Right here, it's found bilateral and posteriorly. So this was uh, the CT scan, it's a sagittal view, and you can't really tell much from this view of any abnormality. However, in the axial views, you can tell that there's something amiss right there. And these are just different planes and different axial slides, but you can tell one right there as well and another one where this missing right there. So the embryonic development, how does a person actually get a congenital missing cervical pedicle? So a congenital means at birth, born with. Um, during the third, fourth week of uh, gestation, uh, 38 pairs of mesodermal tissue called somites uh, develop and produce uh, the skeletal structure and the skeletal muscles. Um, the vertebral segment doesn't take place until the uh, seventh week of uh, gestation, and full closure doesn't take place until the third month of life. Um, however, uh, during the fourth week, uh, the embryo changes shape from a flat disc to a cylinder-type uh, shape, a process known as embryonic folding with three germ layers. Now, these three germ layers are responsible for developing the entire body. There's the ectoderm germ layer, which is responsible for the skin and the nerve findings within the skin. There's the endoderm layer, which is responsible for the GI tract, mouth all the way down. And then there's the mesoderm, which is the um, uh, middle layer, uh, responsible for the or organs and the skeletal structure. And it's around this process, this time period, where it is said that the pedicles do not fuse or do not develop. So a locked facet uh, joint is a type of facet dislocation um, resulting in injury to the apophyseal 
uh, joint ligaments where the um, inferior articular process of the superior vertebrae jumps over the superior articular process of the inferior vertebrae, giving the, the, the image of a jumped and a locked facet. Um, these types of injuries usually involve severe ligamentous uh, strain and therefore surgery is usually warranted. Now the problem over here is that if a person um, is diagnosed with a jumped and a locked facet when in fact he, is, he has or she has a congenital missing cervical pedicle then unnecessary surgery is indicated. And this type of injury is very commonly occurs after traumatic accident, uh, whereby the cervical spine is flexed forcefully, causing injury. And usually people with congenitally missing cervical pedicles uh, never have any complaints. They usually found an incidental finding, like this patient after a motor vehicle accident, or even like a football game. So as you can see here, this is uh, the jump in a lock facet. And you can see that the spine is not fully aligned. So compared to an x-ray which detects about 60 to 80 percent of fractures, a CT scan has a higher specificity and sensitivity, being able to detect about 97 to 100 percent of fractures. Uh, treatment differs from stabilized to non-stabilized injuries, and a congenitally missing cervical pedicle will usually fall under uh, the treatment for a stabilized injury. If the injury consists of a fracture without subluxation, without slippage, um, and devoid of neurological symptoms, then treatment is conservative, consisting of a cervical collar, uh, physical therapy, and avoidance of contact sports, which this patient was recommended. Uh, patients with fractured pedicles are at risk for cervical spine instability um, and subsequent neurological deterioration, uh, such as loss of deep tendon reflexes, loss of bowel and bladder control, loss of motor strength, loss of sensation, low blood pressure, generalized weakness, uh, etc. So the patient who had initially a halo vest, uh, she had that removed and was discharged home three days later after complete resolution of initial complaints. Um, she was sent home with a Miami J collar and instructed to follow up within two weeks. Um, when she did follow up in two weeks, we removed the uh, cervical collar and uh, she had great range of motion. However, she was instructed not to follow her current weight routine, weight training routine of benching 200 pounds and squatting 200 pounds. As well, she was recommended not to continue with her uh, wrestling team, just for precautionary measures rather than, you know, uh, anything solid. So in conclusion, uh, a congenitally missing cervical pedicle may be confused for a jump and a lock facet, which may lead to unnecessary surgery and therefore x-rays, CT scans, and MRIs must be obtained uh, before a final diagnosis. The lifelong limitations for contact sports are more precautionary rather than absolute, um, owing to the lack of research regarding the absence of a congenitally missing cervical pedicle. Uh, there was this, another case report where a football player uh, suffered a blow to the cervical spine and subsequently found to have a congenitally missing cervical pedicle. However, he returned to playing football um, six weeks after having physical therapy with post monitoring. Um, there's this uh, player that Dr. Shaw always mentions, uh, Peyton Manning. I don't watch football, but uh, he, uh, he uh, supposedly had a fusion surgery and then went back to playing football. Um, in a sports science video, it is said that a football player can hit you with about a thousand pounds of force. Uh, so it's quite dangerous as you go back to playing football. So the next case report is gout in the thoracic spine. Now having gout is not really rare, but having gout in the spine is. Um, and it's of great importance because the first reported case was in the 1950s and less than 120 reported cases uh, till date. And um, usually if a patient has a medical history, a present medical history of gout and complains of back pain, this should be part of your differential diagnosis. So the clinical presentation, we have this 34-year-old uh, white male who presents to ER after an episode of sudden onset of leg weakness that progressed to a paraplegic state. 
on uh, exam, uh, he had five out of five upper extremity test, um, strength test. However, he was barely able to move his legs off the table. Um, he was then rushed for an MRI. Once again, the initial test of choice is an MRI to make sure there isn't any cord compression. However, this third patient uh, had this lesion center posteriorly at the T9 level causing severe cord compression. So as you can see here, this is a two-weighted uh, MRI. I don't know if you guys can see it very clearly. Um, no? No. Sorry. Sorry. It's a small mirror. Um, oh, sweet. Uh, so, there it is. yeah, the T2 weighted uh, <laughs> MRI uh, image size for you. And, um, sorry about that. Well, right here, there's a compression. <laughs> right around here. And it's uh, clearly identified on this next side, <laughs> right in the middle. Sorry about that. And over here as well, right in the top, there's this, a lot of cord compression. So, uh, due to severe cord compression and the patient's symptoms, uh, emergency surgery was uh, indicated. Um, levels of T7, T8, um, T9, and T10 laminectomies uh, were performed for the removal of the extradural lesion. Um, however, during surgery, um, copious amounts of homogeneous white crystal type material was found. Um, when sent to pathology, cytological and histological tests revealed the classic needle shaped crystals with negative bifringence on polarized light. Um, consistent with gout. It took approximately, uh, now the fear before the operation was that the patient might not be able to walk again um, with a severe cord compression. However, it took about four weeks of recovery time from learning to stand in the first week uh, to using a walker in the second and third weeks and then finally being able to walk without support in the fourth week. So the patient denied any family history of gout or prior episodes of mid-back pain. However, was prescribed allopurinol when diagnosed with hyperuricemia three years after being diagnosed with bipolar disorder in 1995. So what is gout? So gout is a very painful uh, disease when high uric acid in uh, the body uh, goes to the joints and develops crystals. Now, usually the crystals can form with between 8 to 12 hours, and um, usually it's dissolved in the blood. It goes to your kidneys where it's excreted in the urine. Um, if you have an overproduction of uric acid, which occurs about 10% of the time, or an under-excretion of uric acid, which occurs about 90% of the time, then you have a condition called hyperuricemia. Hyperuricemia itself is not a condition or anything to worry about. Um, you know, it's an antioxidant. It actually helps blood flow. But too high levels can actually then lead to crystal formation. And that's when you have gout. Now, acute attacks of gout are often triggered by specific events such as trauma, uh, surgery, illness, excess alcohol intake, or drugs that alter serum urate levels. The patient was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in 1995 um, with schizophrenic tendencies and since has been on atypical antipsychotics, which can also alter serum uric acid metabolism. So the classic, classic case of a patient with gout is a male in his mid-30s who presents to the ER. Uh, can you, is it possible to, to pull these blinds? Is the only one? Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you. Um, uh, oh, so classic case. So classic case is a male in his mid thirties who presents to the ER after uh, with big toe pain after a night of binge drinking. Um, this condition is called podagra, which is gout in the base of the big toe, um, the metatarsophalangeal joint. And it presents, uh, it's the initial manifestation of 50% uh, of the people with gout. Um, so your body kind of prioritizes what acid to get rid of first. The stronger the acid, it will be the number one priority. Alcohol is metabolized to lactic acid, which is a stronger acid compared to uric acid. So the body will try to get rid of that first, <laughs> leaving uric acid levels to build up and then, you know, like I said before, uh, it doesn't take crystal very long for crystal formation to occur. Eight to twelve hours, the patient or the guy wakes up, and he has this toe. <laughs> <laughs> so increased adiposity and insulin resistance syndrome can also alter urate levels, uh, uric acid levels. Uh, the more adipose tissue you have, the more fat you have the more of uh, leptin, which is a hunger inhibiting hormone you have, which actually also uh, disrupts the metabolism of uric acid. Um, insulin resistance syndrome as well, uh, when you have exogenous insulin, that can also alter the metabolism of uric acid. Um, according to the Food and Drug Administration, clozapine, risperidone, and valproate, all of these which, which were prescribed uh, to the patient have a possible side effect of hyperuricemia as reported by patients from the years 2004 to 2012. So in a data analysis of 113 patients with gout in the spine, uh, 28 of them um, had gout in the spine as the initial manifestation. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, 50% uh, of all patients with gout will have the big toe as the initial manifestation. Um, of these 113 patients, 66 had gout in the lumbar region, 28 had gout in the cervical region, and 24 had gout in the thoracic region. Um, 88 patients of the 113 complained of neurological symptoms, radiculopathy being the most common. Um, and only 23 patients complained of solely back pain. Um, so tophus gout doesn't present a characteristic image on imaging, um, and that's why it's very difficult to differentiate it from other lesions such as meningiomas, tumors, infections, or even abscesses. So a retrospective study was done in which uh, 64 patients with gout had CT scans of their spine, and was uh, found 14%, about 9 patients, uh, presented with features of spinal gout. Um, the same research group did a, a prospective study of uh, 48 subjects, of which 35%, which is about 17 patients, uh, who had erosions, spinally gout erosions after CT scans. So in conclusion, uh, patients with gout in the thoracic spine can have uh, MR imaging, uh, giving the appearance of metastasis and tumors, uh, such as meningiomas. Uh, tophus gout should be part of the differential diagnosis in patients who have imaging showing cord compression um, and with the present medical history of gout. Gout is also an extremely rare side effect of atypical antipsychotic medication and extremely unusual in the spinal column.